call the regional school committee to order and we're going to start with the we don't have any students this evening we don't have any public comment um, we have some words to say to our regional school committee members but we'll save that for a little bit and we'll start with student reports and headmasters reports sure Thank you, Ms. Graham. Um, just a couple of things to report from the high school. Um, as some of you know, as uh, parents who uh, have students at the high school, we are in the midst of our AP exam schedule this week and next week. Um, I want to just uh, thank Liz Benati for really outstanding work in coordinating everything from room locations to relocating people. I want to thank Scott Kellett for his flexibility and, and help because we've actually had to relocate a couple classrooms to his building as well as using every space we can with the intent of obviously our kids having the best possible testing environment so that's really worked well um, right now um, I am meeting with department chairs on determining sections for the 2017-2018 school year for the master schedule once uh, that has been completed we then turn it over to Ann Keegan and Rob Williamson and Terry Luskin who do their magic. Um, I did want to extend a special invitation to the Regional School Committee on May 18th, Thursday at 3.30. We will have our senior project presentations. Uh, for those of you who have not had that opportunity, they are fantastic. We have about 50 some odd kids out on senior project. And there's some really neat creative ones happening. This year we actually have a young lady down in Washington, D.C., which is fabulous. Um, a number of kids who are participating in our school systems, um, as well as physical therapy, uh, law offices, communication departments, TV departments, and we actually have a pretty neat project going on this year. Doug Keene is working on rebuilding one of our um, sheds, our storage sheds out back, and he's working with Nick Rout and with Dean Bogan and with Ralph Kelly, uh, so he's going through the whole process of you know, measurements, taking things apart, determining what he needs, ordering the supplies, having the delivery, being there for the delivery, um, all the way to the point where he'll be reconstructing this shed and then turning it back over to um, the school, which is fabulous. And um, also just wanted to thank the school committee, as well as Don Kikori and Bill McCalda for their support in providing a new van. Our van has arrived, the Dover Sherborne van. And uh, we're just um, awaiting the final pieces with the license plate. And we will be able to use that for um, school-related functions, as well as athletic functions, field trips. And we feel as though it'll be a nice cost saver um, and certainly be a lot more convenient. It's a beautiful van, seats 14, safe. Uh, it has storage in the back, so if any of our additional equipment can go in the back so it's not crowding the kids. Uh, really is a, a nice piece of equipment. So thank you to uh, the school committee and the taxpayers of Dover and Sherborne for their support of that. Thank That's you. my report. Thank you, John. Um, I do want to say uh, in the written report was seminar day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I went to the up. opening yeah. speaker. I don't know if anyone else mm -hmm. had stuff on that day. But um, great opportunity for the yes, students yes. to see and participate in the yeah. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks to DSEF for allowing us to have that. And our plan is to have seminar day run every other year. Oh, good. Yeah. Great. Mr. Kelly? I'll call your attention to the artwork that is over on the board. It's a seventh grade close observation nature drawings. And this is a um, product of our a DSEF grant. So thanks to DSEF for supporting our, our interdisciplinary project that involved art, English, science in the seventh grade. And uh, we had a well-known author, Ray Griffin Burns, who came in on our early release day, or made start day in April. And that's some of the work that was done um, by our seventh graders. Uh, I want to wish good luck to Eric Yang, who's heading to Orlando, Florida on Thursday. And he will be part of the Massachusetts Map Counts team. He was one of the top four finishes in the state. So he will be part of the team that will compete against teams from the rest of the country. Uh, congratulations to Sophie Katz and Jack Worth, who were selected as scholar leaders uh, by our eighth grade teachers. And they will be attending the Mellon Scholar Leader Dinner on May 17th in Marlboro. 
We want to give special thanks to Junior Sophie Sharon, Sam Gray, and Amy Arsetti, who under Ms. Bergeron's oversight directed our three one-act plays this past weekend. And that included uh, Amy Arsetti, who, who took the cast of the Seuss Odyssey to the drama festival <coughs> on Sunday, where they were uh, earned a bronze medal at the Rashi School. And we had two performers, Izzy Taylor and Marisol Smez, who were recognized for their efforts um, in that show. And finally, the, the special time of the year in the middle school, uh, next week we start our second round of um, <laughs> very, excited. very excited for it. Um, I bet they can't wait. They, they can't wait. But, uh, yeah. uh, but on that note, I do want to thank the IT department, particularly Nick Jones, who oversaw our, our administration of the uh, English NCAS for the eighth grade online. It was all computerized, and he was phenomenal in in making it run so smoothly. Uh, they were all great, but he was the one that any issue, it was fixed immediately. He was on top of it, so we greatly appreciate that. Any response from the kids? The response from the kids was, and I talked to several several kids just to get a sense if they liked it better, was they liked the idea of being able to type, because people were mostly did paper pencil. They did not really like having to scroll back to passages to, oh, right. to you know supposed to turn a page, so they found that a little bit of a pain, uh, but they did like the the typing part of it. Are you saying that yes. in in the administration of the exam, the the passage that the question is on isn't on the same screen as where they're trying to answer? For the most part, no. No. <laughs> Are you not allowed to? give printed copies of those materials? No. You don't have access to, to them until you take You can test. scroll back. You can scroll, can scroll back, back yeah. and, and they, they, there wasn't one student who didn't comment on that. And I probably spoke to, I'd say, 30, 35 students. And, uh, and that's not our computers. That's the way they that's, set it up. That's how the, the test is administered. Yeah. Is there, is there a, a mechanism for <laughs> Sending that feedback to where it belongs. Yes and yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Why, don't you, why don't you get the uh, the the M um, Association MASC group all worked up about mm -hmm. that? It doesn't seem to take much. To say <laughs> that bulletin board. You but, go. Luckily, I, yeah. I I'm sorry, Scott. You were saying no. I, there there is a, a mechanism there to provide feedback. But I, I, overall, it went much smoother than than we could have hoped. It was uh, it cost a lot of angst. I know that I was here on Sunday making sure the machines were plugged in and charging, just because that's my OCD came in. So schools that had elected to do park. This wasn't anything like Park. This was still much more like MCAS. It's or was this some it's, weird? It's a combination of blend. the two. Yes, it's, it's a, a hybrid. Okay. Uh, but some schools elected to do Park electronically. Others mm -hmm. elected to do a paper. Oh, I didn't think there was a paper Park. It was in terms of content. I mean, not that I want to go down to the nitty gritty of Park versus MCAS, but Overall, in the way that you could sort of sum up the difference between the SAT and the ACT in a couple sentences in terms of the kind of test they are, like what what is the sort of general difference between PARP and MCAS in terms of the kinds of skills they're testing? There is, yeah, really is there is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, the, it, it's uh, the nature, the, the uh, uh, the nature of the questions uh, were are, are designed to be uh, a little different, uh, but but in the end, there was not a whole lot of difference. And the new generate the next generation of cast is is being designed. And again, there will be more changes next year. Uh, 
uh, right. especially related to feedback that, that they do receive. And uh, next generation MCAS is really Massachusetts ver will be Massachusetts version of Park. So it's we're not going away from MCAS. It, it's still similar to. I, I mean, MCAS. I'm just curious: is one more comprehension based, one more analytic? Like, is there something that one teases out better than the other? You know, one's more subject oriented, one's more big thinking. No, is there uh, mm -hmm. no, 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 and they actually there's yeah. some purchase so park so items to go on the next generation MCAS. So it's it's a blending of the two assessments that were uh, released initially, but I think it's it just assesses the standards that are set out in Massachusetts. Did, did you guys sense even any shift towards more nonfiction versus? Fiction when it came to reading passages? That actually like came that? about as a, as a result of the um, ELA standards in 2010. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're prepared. So but I, not even that was a. You know, no. No. Sure. no. No, but there has been a migration to more nonfiction yes. related questions over the last four, four, years, four years, especially. Especially that. Yes. Uh, at the last meeting, a couple of questions came up. One of the questions uh, that, that was asked uh, by the committee was the uh, uh, clarification of, of students taking uh, the ELA version on different days, which is never, you know, under the paper and pencil version. They go, oh, it was the same day at the same time. And in fact, <clears throat> with the uh, online version, uh, we have the flexibility of scheduling different groups on different days because uh, when students go online, as I understand it, they're automatically assigned a version, and there are many, many different versions uh, of, of the exam. And so uh, that is not an issue uh, in terms of kids. Obviously, we talk to each other about their experience, but they're not saying, you know, question 15 was X. And then uh, there was another question that came up. If it was timed or or not, and it is untimed. It is untimed. And then the, there was the third question: Do we have the would we have the capacity? Because remember, we only did uh, we only did it in two grades. One grade. One grade. Year. Well, at middle school, school, right? And then and then fifth grade and at the fourth elementary. Grade. School. Fourth grade, and that was just for the ELA. Uh, you know, do we have the capacity moving forward to uh, uh, doing the entire exam online? And and we do. I mean, we will we'll have to we'll have to share some equipment and some devices, but uh, I think there's a point and a place to do that. Right? Yes, I've been working with Mr. Attack and the technology director to assure that we're ready. Even the infrastructure was um, robust, and I think some of the practice yeah. tests allowed yeah. you to be able to see where we needed to increase the Wi-Fi. Right. We, we did a trial, a practice test with the eighth grade students about three weeks before, and there were some issues with students logging in and getting bumped off because too many students were trying to log in at the same time. So what they did is put in more, you know, more access points in that we had the students all test in the science one. Uh, just in case there were issues from a technology standpoint, the IT folks would be right there and, and it wouldn't be going from upstairs to downstairs to upstairs. All the rooms were right in the same location and that worked out very well. Um, science teachers were able to still teach in other locations and they had plenty of warning. So it worked out having everybody in that area. More access points, and there were no issues with students logging on the day of the, the actual test. Mm -hmm. Now, our staff did a fabulous job in their planning, uh, in the planning for this. Absolutely. Very proactive in terms of the the practice test was a great idea, mm -hmm. and really uh, ended up being um, you know a huge assist. It was it, engaged. It's why you did practice, practice right. test? Yeah. So in the end, it's, it's still dependent upon an internet connection outside of this building. It's completely web-based with an app that's sent out to each of those Google Chromebooks. 
So it's only a matter of time before some school's internet goes down in the middle of one of these things. Well, it's okay. <laughs> Not necessarily us, but no, no, no it's, it's it's bound to happen. Yeah. Okay. So it's, but it, even with the paper version, fire alarms go off, and you know you have situations that come up, and, and you just go with the punches. Sure. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Next, uh, assistant superintendent report. Okay, correct. So I provided a foreign language elementary Spanish update for the regional school committee. There has been uh, some planning, thinking about when we assimilate these grade six students in the fall of 2019, um, so that they'll become, uh, what, will, what will the next steps be? Great meeting with Jeff Farris, the foreign language department at the high school, Kelly Egan, the middle school curriculum coordinator, the two um, plus educators, Tanya Bridge and Laura Romer at the elementary level, and the two principals of Richard Green, I know, and myself, and just talking about what that looks like. We're looking at the levels of reading, writing, speaking, and listening, but also what proficiency level might our students enter sixth grade with. Um, so we'll spend some time developing an assessment from fifth grade to sixth, um, looking at maybe using that proficiency approach, looking at novice, um, students entering sixth grade as a novice learner, um, and um, assuring that we continue to use the targeted language um, in the elementary classrooms. It is amazing to see how far it has progressed since the initial concept in 2013. And um, I, I applaud the school committee for supporting such a program to um, our our elementary students because it's um, something that is not seen in too many districts. So uh, a very important part of our global education. And can you just, um, there's a last sentence in there about um, Spanish to our current social studies and science content. Yes, so at the, yes, me, at the elementary level, the, the Spanish content is integrated into science and social studies. Oh, so that's right. And Kelly Egan is actually going to look at that over the summer and in, in the upcoming year to um, assimilate that in the same way so that students hear the English version of whatever they're studying in social studies and it can be replicated in Spanish. Okay, interesting. Um, is the, I understand this is uh, preliminary and, and, more, and more of a change as it looked at more closely, but is it your sense that this is going to reach the, the uh, middle school with um, different, with sixth graders at different levels and therefore going into classes that are populated by sixth graders and seventh graders, maybe even sixth and seventh and eighth graders? Is that part of what you foresee the solution to be or not? Not currently, because we can't anticipate what those fifth graders will be able to know and be able to do in those four content areas. We know that they won't be fluent in writing because they're using that phonetic approach currently. But it remains to be seen because I could not have anticipated what our current third graders are able to do. So, uh, you know, could be. So, could be. so if I understand how we are doing languages now, sixth and seventh grade is, is novice one, eighth grade is novice two or middle, and then ninth grade is novice three or high. So the current speculation is, is that they may be in effect entering at what's now a ninth grade level of Spanish if they stay on? No, no, no. no, no, no. So I don't understand novice high then context here. This is the, a type of a proficiency approach. I should, I, I could give you links to those if you want some further information. So the labels of the courses don't correlate to the proficiency levels. So we we'll, would be looking at novice, novice high, intermediate low, intermediate high. And I would suggest um, that our eighth graders are at an intermediate level currently. And then as they transition to the high school, they go into Spanish two, I believe. Three, three, so that they're, we would start to look at that proficiency level, but it's not something we currently have in place. Okay, but the use of the phrase novice they and do. intermediate in the high school That's correct. But curriculum, it but it's different than in this context. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. So, um, an issue I won't have to grapple with, what? and you too, Karen, but um, <laughs> is um, 
twofold. Obviously, one is budgetary and, and how we're going to cope with that. But the other one, which, which in some ways may be as, as challenging, is especially as these kids move into the high school, whether their, whether their need for a placement that doesn't necessarily match the, the majority grade level um, is going to throw further pressures onto scheduling. Um, and frankly, I think that would, that would really be a, 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 probably a pain and, 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 and potentially a significant problem. And I'm wondering whether as this goes forward, whether somebody, somebody who's involved in this going forward would keep that in mind as well. Because if it does that, then I'm not sure what we've gained um, because scheduling is already a, a real problem for making sure that kids get to do what they want to do. The think, current thinking is as kids progress through middle school, their brains are also um, progressing too. And the age of 14 is you know, some abstract reasoning. So to think about that, I think that, that most kids will all balance out. So their ability to read, write, listen, and speak in Spanish will balance out. Currently, I had a very long conversation with Jeff Ferris at the high school. They're seeing a, a differentiated lens in their Spanish classes currently and can move and, and shift to allow those kids to learn at the pace they need to. Within the same class. I don't yes. honestly see yeah. anything that's going to change except um, that these students will have a better understanding of the language um, and be more fluent um, in the areas of um, reading, speaking, and listening when they get to the high school. I think another potential upside is for those kids who do advance um, within that process, they may be able to, as an end result, take Spanish as juniors, the AP Spanish as juniors. Mm -hmm. True. Which would then actually senior year free them up, which is sometimes the difficult decision mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. seniors have to make. Fourth year of a language, but I want to double up in science, mm -hmm. or I want to double up in social studies. So it's for some kids, not all, but for some, it may actually help them in their scheduling. And because we currently do have some sections that we differentiate within the same classroom with a combined CP honors mm -hmm. curriculum. It's not unlike uh, when you adopted algebra for all eighth graders and how the high school trajectory began. So I think it's the same analogy for Spanish. But it still remains to be seen. It's, and, it's encouraging. And do we have any understanding of other districts that have pursued this that if they offered languages in the middle school what that did to the non-Spanish offerings was there any take rate at that point to start all over again at the beginning with either Latin or French there are only a few districts that um, have Spanish as fluent as we will um, so it, that also remains to be seen although I think that there are some families that will still choose French for their sixth graders even though they have been exposed to Spanish because that's their choice, uh, family choice. That's a family choice that we would have made because of my husband's heritage. But um, certainly we'd look at both. Because we tend to, at least by the high school level, run with maybe two sections of French at this point? Correct. And one we have section more, of Latin? Uh, yes. Yes, correct. So. Some of the students can take the Latin beginning in the middle school, and typically most of those kids will continue through. Um, Chinese is obviously the one where they will start fresh. Yeah. We sometimes have kids start fresh, or we actually have sometimes kids will double up. Mm -hmm. If they have a real language preference, they may continue with Spanish and then pick up Mandarin as well. Great things happening. And I just wanted to mention the educator and administrator surveys um, um, as part of the, the new evaluation system in three years and feedback from students and staff is used for informed instruction. But the thing I wanted to highlight here is for the first time, educator results from the surveys of their student surveys will be reported at the school and district level and the administrator results were always reported at the district level. So we're looking at those now. Could you say that again? I didn't quite understand. 
So the student surveys of, of each individual educator in the classroom yeah. last year was reported uh, confidentially only to that educator. Right. This year they were reported at the school level and then at the district level. How is that happening? Oh, these these are these are numerical ratings on a number of different questions. Different. What's being reported is an aggregate, not presume. I assume not individual scores. Exactly. Or that, or the individual no, that's an aggregate as a whole class. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Claire. Good evening, everyone. Uh, provided for you uh, was just some information uh, regarding uh, this past year's uh, personnel changes. So changes from uh, from September 1st or August 30th, I guess, uh, through the current period, as well as an update on uh, end of the year retirements and resignations. I will say that uh, the 16-17 school year of the region in terms of personnel has been a very stable year. As you'll note, we've, uh, uh, we did have uh, one, our junior network administrator uh, resigned. Uh, we just hired uh, his replacement who will start at the end of the month. Uh, we have had a teacher on leave. Uh, this is a part-time teacher. And uh, one of our, uh, our uh, Pine Hill School art teacher has been able to fill in, so that's that's worked well uh, for us. And then um, we did have uh, the, one of the administrative assistants uh, at the high school. Uh, we had a vacancy because of a resignation in September. And then uh, going into next year, uh, we knew of uh, as of February first, we knew of three retirements and a resignation that. Fourth resignation actually is becoming a retirement. Person is, is retiring, and then since uh, uh, just over the last uh, uh, number of weeks, uh, our uh, Gina Zoller, one of our middle school Spanish teachers, uh, is actually moving, and uh, so we'll be resigning at the end of the year. And uh, our uh, team chair at the high school, Mindy Roberts, has decided to retire. So we'll be moving forward to uh, find replacements for them. Uh, we have uh, we have not uh, finalized the new hires in any of the other vacancies yet, and we'll provide you another update in June. All right. And then lastly, in addition, it, sorry, yes. you have a question? Oh. so Bob was Martel was also teaching in the middle school. How did that work with the schedule? He was morning in the high school and afternoon in the middle school. He taught one block here in the middle school. There's only what? One block. And one block down there. Other questions on that? And then I, I would like to uh, report out, everyone is aware, but uh, with the conclusion of last night's Dover town meeting, uh, the uh, regional FY18 budget is now official. It, uh, both town meetings approved approved the budget. Both town meetings did also approve the capital uh, plan and budget. And uh, we'll talk more about the FY18 capital uh, as well as give an update on current and previous years uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, like to uh, thank uh, the staff who uh, really did an excellent job. Uh, on, on budget preparation this year. Uh, special thanks to Don, who uh, did Yeoman's work and did an excellent job. Uh, thanks to the school committee for your support and your uh, role in that process, as well as uh, thanks to both the Warren Committee and the, and the Advisory Committee, particularly our liaisons, who, uh, uh, who asked good questions throughout the process. and. Uh, I think we have a, an FY18 budget that will serve uh, the needs of our students and staff very well uh, for next year. So that's thank good you, news thank to you report. Well. Thank you. Yeah. I hear both. No questions at either meeting, which is.
Correct. Uh, no questions on the operating budgets or the capital budgets. Right. Um, <laughs> job well done. Didn't have time for that. We're keeping your powder dry. So, so are rail trails coming to Dover? They are. Well, they could be. All right, all right. We're on the regional school at the moment. And we can actually get Springdale. So in your packet, next item, uh, financial reports. You have the monthly report uh, with a number of uh, additional information. Uh, Don will just spend a short period of time taking you through that. Uh, uh, the FY18 operating budget, actually, I just gave you the FY18 operating budget, right? Is there another update on that? Oh, no, not no, the budget. No, that's it. So, okay. Right. It's in the books. It's in the books. So and you actually uh, have the final. Um, Big pages for your books. Okay. Yeah. And then we'll uh, get to the capital uh, subcommittee report. Don't. Okay. So uh, you have your monthly financial report as of um, April 30th. Just a couple of things to mention on the revenue side. So as we previously mentioned, uh, we uh, wanted to take a closer look at our Chapter 71 transportation uh, reimbursement because based on our first payment in December, it appeared that. Um, it was more than what we would have thought based on what our cherry sheet said. So with a little further digging, um, it's, because um, I think I mentioned this could be happening, from the amendment we had to file for our fiscal year 15 end of the year report, we're still sort of seeing a trickle effect for that. But it's caught up so that when we got our first payment for transportation in December, they had used the real number um, versus an estimated number based on our fiscal year. 15 end of the year report. So we are seeing a favorable balance on current year Chapter 71 transportation of about $144,000. In addition, um, the amendment that was filed will result in a prior year adjustment that we will also be getting in June to make up for the monies you know that we were short in 16. So uh, I have confirmed with the um, DOR that that amendment is being processed, and we should expect to see any additional monies due to us in our June payment. We're estimating that to be between eighty-five and ninety thousand. And what happens to all this money? A lot of money. We'll have to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so that's that's it's a lot of transportation money that we did not have in our initial uh, budget. So in the, in the prior year. Remember we were short? We had, no, that's yeah. the point. So we had budgeted a certain amount. We got at least that, correct? No, we were um, under what we had budgeted. That was a shortfall, I believe. Um, either that or it's what, we had, what they had rolled into the anticipation. So because it caught us off guard in June when that last payment came in, and it wasn't what we thought we were going to get. And that's when we realized that the end of the year report had a small error in Schedule 7. Because we did not file that amendment until, I think it was <coughs> Right, so this July. would have occurred after our <coughs> June yes. meeting? Yes, yes. Well, right. We were just reporting that we... Yes, so when we so when we projected our what our surplus was going to be, which resulted in the votes we took to reduce the assessments... We were not aware we, of what okay. was going on. So we did not end up with as much surplus then? Yes, that, that's right. Yes. Okay. Surplus that's right. Because we, in uh, May, in March of last year, February of last year, we uh, assumed that the the Chapter 70 amount that was budgeted the previous year, you know, that was that was the process for putting together, together FY16's budget. We assumed we would be receiving that. It wasn't until after the payment came in in June where it was light. Okay. So yep. Even though that occurred, if I remember correctly, we still exceeded our 5%. Yeah, right. Yeah. E and D. Correct. Right. Then those, and then these monies are eventually, now that you filed all the paperwork, stuff that we should have received 12 months ago is now going to show up. Right. And we, we did we did talk about this last yeah. last fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, right. And and the issue was that when Don uh, 
Don worked with DSC to ask the question, you know, why, did, why didn't we get the money that we were going to get? Mm -hmm. And uh, what had happened was the, uh, the information that was filed in the previous year's end of the year report, uh, there, were, there were some errors in it. So we were able to, in a timely fashion, uh, amid, file an amended report with the correct information which then uh, uh, allowed us to receive <coughs> the funds that were available. Uh, but it, That's but their practice is that uh, they actually will, uh, they wait till the following year, the end of the next year, the last payment, just to ensure that they have money in there in the Chapter 71. Budget. And our 17 charity sheets, based on what they <coughs> paid us in 16, which is why it's, there's this trickle right. effect. So when we got our first payment in December, it was um, almost, it was more, way more than half of what we had in the budget. But if you go back to what we filed in Schedule 7 for 16, the, mo the, mo the money we got in December was exactly half of what it should have been under 70% reimbursement. So that's fair, I can verify that we're gonna get a duplicate payment in June, right. plus fiscal year 16 income money. Um, as I mentioned in March 2, we are going to hopefully be requesting that the school committee consider not making two transfers that were uh, built into the 17 budget. One is a $20,000 transfer uh, the building, uh, building park pain rental fund into, and there's a $25,000 uh, transfer from the athletic revolving fund. As I discussed, the, uh, and you actually have your March 31st report of all the revolving funds. If you take a look at your athletics revolving fund, we actually don't have 25,000. So um, <laughs> that would be, yeah, be, yeah, be, be a little short there. Um, and on the uh, parking, what happens on an annual basis too is if you look at your revenue statements, um, we budget parking fees. So we budgeted $43,000. What happens is that anything over what we budget gets transferred back to the building parking rental fund. So last year, if you remember, we brought 20000 into the general fund and 14000 went out because our parking was over. So we're doing a lot of entries. It actually causes us a headache when you go to do all the reporting. So um, even though we're not going to make the $20,000, we're already ahead on parking by $9,600. So we will just leave all the parking in there that we sort of make up for the 20000 that we were going to go out because we still have another round of two months of parking to come in from the juniors. Um, and so it's not going to have a big budgetary impact on the bottom line, but it's much cleaner from an accounting standpoint. And if you remember, in our fiscal year 18 budget, we didn't budget for any of these kind of transfers. It muddies the waters, and it gets really confusing. Personally. So I, what I wanted to show you was, okay, let's say we're not going to do that. Yes. This is the financial impact, so when come in June, you can see that it's, it's not going to be that direct to make that decision. No. Thanks, Tom. In addition, there's, there's ample, there's yeah. ample <laughs> revenue coming in exactly. to cover the budget of the month. Right. right. On the status of appropriations, there is nothing new on the salary front to um, share with you. We're still looking at a projected salary variance of approximately 65,000. Um, we have gone further and projected a few more um, variables or variances in the expenditure side. We've been talking about the employer-related benefits. Um, I'm showing you the net number because that's made up of multiple things, workers' comp, uh, FICA, retiree expense and um, active health care. So that right now we're projecting um, a $20,000 negative variance. But we are projecting that on the transportation, we're going to have a $30,000 favorable balance. balance um, variance, sorry. That predominantly is because we do schedule, um, or we do budget for fuel surcharge, where we're having credits this year. So. Um, that we got the, we got the whole surplus or the whole reserve that we budgeted plus we're getting credits that's going against that. So that's predominantly they call it a part of the 30,000. In addition, um, with winter a little bit behind us now, um, we can um, safely project that there'll probably be a $20,000 variance in all the utilities 
and some of that is from the phone, um, mainly because we've talked about this before, but we get the E-rates, E-rate revenue. The E-rate credits now are going on our phone bill, so you don't see them reported in miscellaneous revenue anymore. They're making our phone bills that we actually pay lower. So we're seeing that variance, and we just made that switch. So we're seeing that variance on the expenditure side, but you're seeing a shortage up in the revenue side under miscellaneous revenue. Um, and as I mentioned, you do have the March 31st, I mean the March, yeah, the March 31st um, roll forward of all of your special revenue and revolving funds. Um, I will highlight on these that um, the gifts, the uh, gifts, you accept was back in the fall, but the um, sailboats mm -hmm. have been delivered. Um, so you're seeing part of it. The activity in the miscellaneous gifts um, detail on the back, the rest of the activity happened in April, both the check coming in and the final payment of the votes. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions on the revolving funds. Again, you have the detail of any restricted funds that we have, so you can see what your available balances are. Um, we are hoping to, I'll jump ahead a little bit on the capital, the carpeting replacement and mudge is hopefully going to be, well, is going to be funded by these monies. So you have this report and we'll bring forward to you in June um, uh, updated quotes as to what that would, what that project will cost over the summer so that you can decide which um, funds you'd like to draw the payment from. As I mentioned, I think the um, the building parking fund is a source as well as the gift fund because of the much gift. That's something to think about for June. Uh, general revenues, uh, the lost book fund, yeah. which has a zero in yeah. budget and a zero collected. Is that because every student is perfect or because something no, is happening? There, the there was a procedural decision to um, let the lost book revenue go into the activities fund. So that's going into the middle school and high school activity fund right now. It's, it's usually less than um, $1,000, not even 1000 It all depends on how aggressively the kids lose <laughs> their books. But, um, so yeah, that was a, a decision made. So, so what's the difference with athletic fees revolving versus in the revenue line high school athletic fees that so, become part of our general So we budget <coughs> right, we budget what we think fees are going to be. It's it works a little bit like the parking. If we ever collected more than we budgeted on athletic fees, that excess goes to the athletic revolving. And there's a small chance we just got all the spring um, uh, checks in um, that will be deposited this week. That there could be a small chance that we might see a little bit. Okay. Um, but that would be zeroed out by a transfer. Yes. So you'll take the whole 256,000, but say we collect 257,000, we transfer a thousand to the athletic revolving fund. Any other questions on sort of the operational side? Okay. So you also have in your packet an update on capital. So just to look at it by project year, which is that's how for the um, IMA are structured, in fiscal year 15, the money that you see left on the detailed schedule is what we are adding to the request that was just approved for fiscal year 18 to finish the, uh, or to complete the um, Lindquist door project. So that will be utilized in 18. As far as 16 goes, we now have finished all those projects, they're paid all the bills, and there's $40,224 remaining in that project year. So we will ask the committee to make a motion to return that money back to the town as prescribed by the IMA. Um, in the same percentage in that it was donated or contributed to um, the, the region. On where we are right now with 17 projects, um, a couple of things to 
uh, note, and we had a, a meeting last week with um, Richard and um, Lori just to update them. Um, we were excited to get the van in on Friday. It was perfect time, and they got to go on and see what that's all about. But I will point out that the passenger van did come in at quite at, at about fourteen thousand dollars more than we projected. If you look at Note One, so we used forty-seven thousand and forty-two dollars from capital, but then we picked up eight thousand dollars and charged it against the general fund athletic transportation um, budget line item, mainly because now it's here on campus and they will save a little bit on um, spring transportation. But they also have some money in that fund that allowed us to take care of that. Okay. The other um, project that I wanted to point out is, you'll see note two, the fire alarm panels. We um, did run into a, um, and this is where contingencies sometimes come into uh, play, um, there was an issue that was not known until they were starting to do the installation, but the wiring that we currently have, which we thought would be compatible with the new systems, is not compatible. So we are having to purchase new wire and have it installed, run from you know, all the control panels up out, back to all the main uh, buildings. And that is, um, we just got an estimate of that, and it's about $16,500. We are going to be charging that work, which we can do in June, to the plant facilities reserve in the operating funds. Sounds good. And this will be completed. Yeah, most, most of them are, yeah. The wastewater treatment project is this close to being um, completed. The, all the fire control panels are being installed once school gets out, and that was at the um, uh, desire of the Dover Fire Chief. Um, I will also mention that the um, ADA compliant handicap doors that were the superintendent's reserve paid for were installed over April break. So now they're working here in the middle school front door of the high school and one of the doors of my school. Great that those are in and uh, we'll do the rest of them with the um, capital project over the summer. So all of my motion? Yes. So um, you need a motion to um, return the funds that FY16 IMA funds to Dover and Sherman based on the terms and the assessment Percentages included in the FY16 IMA. The amounts are noted: Dover $21,902, Sherman $18,322. So moved. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Motion carries. So can I just uh, point out? Can I just point out this? Um, uh, on ongoing uh, capital uh, expenses that, that we've had region has become a well-oiled machine, uh, which is is much to our benefit, um, and uh, it's both a tribute to the, to the town for recognizing how important it is to maintain the buildings, but it's also a tribute to the school committees and especially the administration for making it happen, making it happen in a reasonably predictable way year over year over year, so that people actually get used to it. Uh, and recognize that uh, these aren't strange new expenditures. This is just how you keep up a, a, a major uh, piece of capital up there. So, uh, so it's just great. And, and obviously, it's going to have to continue. And obviously, um, you know, it's going to have to be watched carefully to make sure it doesn't become a slush fund for new stuff we don't need. But it's actually, so this is good news. And just one last thing. Um, uh, thank you, Richard, for that. Uh, but a, and, a, and a reminder of this, I think, is, is certainly timely, but it's it's a, a, always good to remind ourselves of, of, of now that the budget for next year has been passed, some items that have been included in that budget. And uh, they're, they're, if you recall, we did budget um, monies in the regional budget, the Dover budget, and the you know, Sherbrooke budget to update the on-site, in-site report. So uh, they'll be coming back into the dist into the districts uh, over the summer, and uh, they'll be uh, they'll be updating that original report, which will uh, just I think further serve to underscore what you just said, Richard, in terms of uh, 
the process that's now in place and having updated numbers. And uh, I would imagine, no, I would imagine, and I know, um, um, based on their an updated review, uh, a new set of priorities, or at least updated priority uh, lists. So I think that that's uh, an excellent. It's an excellent process. It was such a popular process that it was adopted by Sherborne last year. <laughs> yeah. as we learned from the, the capital, and as right. it was said numerous times, well, yeah, we kind of have to move things around from here to there and whatnot. But they also got an idea of how much had not been getting paid attention to in other infrastructure in there were, Sherborne. There were multiple mentions of they did the, this work so well at the schools that. It's a great roadmap because yeah. you just can't know everything and have your own set of files and so it's it's really a great tool and I think it was the Dover Capital Warrant Committee that pressed so hard way back. Um, Aaron O'Brien. Yeah, I know. they've done it at Charles River School and that's sort of how it came to our area. Regional schools, the laboratory of fiscal responsibility. <laughs> the, the, the downside is the number competition for capital. If I didn't realize how much of it they need. Right. One of the things well, that we got a five year head start. I yeah. thought of while you were mentioning it was um, Dover Green Community, and are there things that we need to be doing that can be built into going forward on the capital? Yeah, so there are, there's a lot. Uh, regional region plans that we can take up and because now both Dover and Sherburne are green communities we can apply for grants. So who looks after that? Is that well it's a, it's a multi-step process and, and the, the first part of the process is that uh, uh, I forget the name of the state organization but it starts with the state letting green communities know what is available uh, to their communities for grants and then the communities uh, then decide uh, they go back to the uh, um, the regional approve the uh, both region yes. and those school committee yes. so uh, there's a there's a long range there's a master plan of, of Project Project, right. That's what I was thinking. Right. So, so once in the capital planning process, once we hear from uh, the town that there are grant funds available, uh, the capital I just I would presume the capital committee would then work with the town side to identify the priorities that are on them on the green community's plan and. Uh, Intertwine that with the and the same rep is, is or Gino is is doing both towns, so it's great because then it helps the regional right. because yeah. both towns are he's sort of orchestrating that. So we have um, you know lighting big lighting projects that are happening in all the town buildings in Dover, so it'll be a nice experience so, for us. Yeah. So at the time that we did the exterior LED in my conversation with Michael Lesser. Mm -hmm. He said that the interior fixtures were still a year or two away from really being an opportunity to, to, to look at conversion. And I guess another part of that to wrap up the exterior lighting project is have we seen, have we starting to be able to document what the impact has been on electrical usage? Not really. I mean, it's just not. We, we don't, I don't think we had a good base of usage way back when that was in place that we were able to track it. And then the air conditioning came on with the middle school, which then skews your, your numbers. So I don't think we, that, I don't think that savings was specifically um, felt necessarily. Well, when we were going over it, we were promised a, a favorable ROI from reduced usage. Yeah, within five years. Yeah. Then. But I think it's, it's hard to isolate but just at the same time. We right. like yeah. 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 and all that. No. And well, the AC was, was several years before. Well, but the other thing I know from personal use is sometimes the saving is also in the, la the longevity of the light bulb. 
Well, that's in addition exactly. to the actual proof. That's what we're seeing in the, in the return on investment for the lighting project and chickering, and part of it's the savings in um, annual maintenance. And but have, but have we not? Well, we've seen a reduction in energy costs at the region. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in electric okay. costs. Right, but it's, it's also a combination of yeah. the supply contracts. Right, our supply costs have gone down. No, but, no, but that's yeah. where you want to look at the units. Right. Usage level, right. Right. whether that ends up translating into your right. financial impact, and it varied. But we were, we were promised a very definite. But my question is, is I mean, you, you can't hold everything else equal over the course of a year or two or three uh, in order to look for that savings. Um, I, I think I think we could trust that the. Um, the lights have the, the waters that they're listed as having, and you can you know, make a subtraction and a multiplication and, and figure out how much it should be saving you. I'm not sure that We've you know, it's all the same. Before I would run for another fifty or $100,000 project to replace more LED to LEDs, I, I would want to hear the past promises made by the provider and by people who have assisted us in the, in the green world. Part of the but I would also assume that it would be far cheaper when you do it again because the price of those bulbs have come down like mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, these are different uh, different fixture yeah. constructs. I know, so but we in were, general, though, there, that's why we didn't do it, look at anything material. So. Okay. I'll just briefly introduce this. Uh, this is an opportunity really for uh, the school committee to get a preview. We're not looking for any action tonight. Uh, if you've had a chance to go through it and you have some questions, John and, and Scott can, uh, uh, can, can answer those. Uh, I think that it might be helpful just, Scott, you, you have a very minor change Yes. Uh, in yours and John, it's just a couple, just a couple but um, I don't know if we need to have them talk about those. I think they're pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Right. Uh, John's matches the driving, yep. parking policy change. And yeah, the only other high school change is we have to add a line if you have a directed research that. Um, Ms. Keegan and I both feel that it's a bigger penalty if you then lose library privileges mm -hmm. as opposed to receiving detentions. And we're really trying to minimize those. You know, they're, they're a, a system that works for some, but for others, it just perpetuates getting more. So we're really trying to move away from that and figure, okay, well, then we won't have library privileges for a couple of weeks or that type of thing. And that's something that the kids thoroughly enjoy. Now that would be different, of course, from if they had to do research for a class or something like that. Right. This is when they would leave their DR to go to the library. So an unexcused absence from a DR. So in terms of process, I mean, these are really good. Okay. Uh, and then we vote it next one? Yes, but especially because of process, uh, the principals review the proposed changes with their school councils. Uh, that's that's been part of the process already at middle school. John is meeting with the school council uh, later this month, so uh, they will have an opportunity to, to, to weigh in. Uh, so we'll, we'll take this up. We'll take this up for a school committee action. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> student parking, which the policy has now been changed to student parking. I believe most other checks remain similar to what we've seen previously. Before we have a motion, do we have any further discussion or changes? So I did speak with Joan Stein, our attorney, on the driving and parking parking only 
um, many schools are still caught driving and parking. Um, it's insinuated we have to drive to school. Her comment was, we can have it whenever we like. <laughs> So, thank you. Our committee, at our committee's pleasure, student parking it is. So, I'll by a motion to approve the revised student parking policy. So moved. Second. Second. And further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Go for it, sophomores, right? <laughs> <laughs> Counting down the bid. Communications. As long as we're a policy, can I bring up Certainly, Richard, I know. Yes. Yeah, we appreciate it. So um, you will have heard me say on more than one occasion, um, I think this uh, committee needs a policy about uh, long-term contracts. Um, we have uh, an extraordinarily unrestrained ability to commit the, uh, the regional school system and therefore the two towns to financial obligations quite possibly in perpetuity I mean, it's a it's a very strange government we run here um, this came up uh, it came became prominent in my mind in the in the fall when we were asked on extremely short notice to um, sign a contract for very favorable terms for long-term energy uh, supply from a solar operation in Dover um, and, I'm sorry. and that made during contract and that meter, thank you. And that meter, thank you. And and we uh, and we did, and and it was probably the right thing to do, but it was done, um, as I said, extremely short notice, and I just think that's wrong. For it's it's bad government, frankly. I would suggest I I didn't draft up a, a particular policy, but I think this committee needs to adopt a policy that has something along the following lines: that for any contract. Uh, that's going to extend longer, and I would say longer than six years, or longer than five years, excuse me, uh, and uh, involves uh, payments of more than $10,000 a year for the duration of the contract, uh, that there be a 30-day notice to the selectmen's, selectmen in each town that the region is considering um, undertaking such a contract, um, and that there be a public hearing at least, I would say, 14 days before um, a fellow vote is taken in the contract. And I think that gives the towns the, ob the opportunity uh, to weigh in on the financial um, wisdom of it uh, and an opportunity for the, for the public to, uh, to weigh in as well. Anyway, that's why I suggest, um, as I say, I don't have anything written up now that we need to act on, but I hope it'll be a uh, uh, quick order business after you start. In your examination of this issue, did you know of either of the towns have a policy to that effect? I don't. So it, it doesn't matter. Night. Towns for energy, for net metering type. There's you can't sign long term contracts for a lot of type of contracts, but energy well, net metering so, is one that you have some the region has some leeway. But Dover last night passed so that uh, selectmen can um, enter into because they lost out because they didn't have the policy. That's how it came about. <laughs> such a last so what does law allow? either municipalities or regions to not do? To not do? What, 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 are, what, yeah, what are we forbidden? <coughs> so, so the law allows uh, municipalities or municipal entities to uh, enter into long-term contracts for these types of services. So net metering, there's two others. Uh, uh, and and so at the regional school committee level, you have the ability to do that at the school committee level. At the municipal level, uh, that has to be approved by town meeting. So is this the only zone of things that that a long term contract would? Because a lot of like, all of our major, it's not like all that's like three years, we can't sign a contract. Yeah, it's, so it's not like we can do uh, yeah. the waste, um, they, they came yeah. to us with yeah. a great deal on services for the waste treatment yep. facility, that, oh, it's only a 10-year, yes. but it's a 10-year contract. But we can't do we, we're not yeah. allowed to do that. There are, I, I, there are a small handful of other exceptions to varying degrees, 
uh, in terms of length. Uh, but I, I will say as a matter of practice, I think the idea of having a policy around long-term, and you could call it net metering, uh, or, or whatever if you want to be that specific, uh, and and along the, 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 the terms, suggested terms that Richard has just talked about, I think as a matter of practice is a good idea. We certainly were not crazy about bringing that agreement to this group with such short notice. It just happened that there was a timing it, issue. It occurred so, outside of our meeting. So. Yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, as a matter of practice, I would encourage the committee to, to look at developing a policy. But as you do that, uh, uh, I think it's also important to provide within that policy some flexibility in terms of, of some time frame, just in case you do come across in right. a, a situation where, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, you have a short time frame to perhaps look at or enter into. It doesn't mean that you have to, but. Right. It would, it would be something we would be allowed to do by law, but we would have tied our hands because of our own policy. But in the, in the context that I was hearing from Richard, we're not, this is not some new obligation that we're entering into. We entered into some type of contractual relationship which was going to have an impact to while we're not contracted to buy electricity next year and the year after and the year after, it's pretty safe to say we will be buying electricity for the next number of years. And pretty good idea of how much we're going to need to use. Well, we're not, we're not really, the net metering thing is sort of, the, we're, not, we're actually, we're buying credits. So we're not, it has nothing to do with us buying electricity. We're getting credits on our distribution yeah, but I'm saying that, that yeah. you were concerned about a contract that you felt was obligating or a situation in the future could obligate us to additional expenses. And I'm not, That's not what I'm not hearing at least what this is, and if this is one of the few areas where we are able to enter into a long-term contract, I, again, I'm, I'm more concerned when we're buying technology that we think will save us money and mm -hmm. electricity usage, and, I, it, and then we can't figure out whether it did or not. I, I understand this. We'll we'll next year's policy committee. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying that I, I'm not seeing quite that. I understand initially it felt like the Pandora's box yeah. was, well, was being identified, but I feel like it, it's, I, you know, it, 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 it's a small teacup. It calms me somewhat to know that it's very limited, but correct me if I'm wrong, I thought we had, in fact, with the cell tower uh, negotiations, that was going to be an extremely long term. It was certainly going to be more than a three year contract because they wouldn't. And I don't think we lack any opportunity for public input. <laughs> That's no, I, I, I agree with you. And and in the in the course of most of the things that would come before this committee, the policy that I'm suggesting would be moved because in fact the the you know, negotiations are going to be are going to last longer than that. But sometimes these things come up. As, okay, as thank far you, Richard, for making that point. You're welcome. Here for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get things off the chest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I will let go one or two more. I know. <laughs> Anything else you need to do? All right. So we're all set on that. Yeah. Um, another one. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're moving to communication. So we have the MECO report and the new school committee minutes of January 24th. Um, uh, no, let me. So, yeah, sure. report uh, so this report was put together at the request of Mr. Robinson, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase what I believe his request was, because, uh, but it was related, I, I believe, to the question of what should the right size mm -hmm. uh, or enrollment, if we want to think about that way, of our metro of our metro program be. If, is that fair enough? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly the question. So, uh, so in, in trying to come forward with some information about that, uh, I thought it would be helpful just to put together some background information for context 
for whenever the committee either instructs the administration to look at this uh, concept in more detail or when the committee perhaps might decide to have just a general conversation about the concept. And so uh, what we did try to do, again, was to put together what, for lack of a better word, I guess, uh, some baseline data and some info general information about METCO, uh, you know, how, how students are, uh, are assigned uh, to Dover and Sherbourne and the region, and uh, as well as some uh, financial data uh, related to the program and uh, felt that this would serve, perhaps serve a purpose uh, for some kind of further deliberations or conversation. So I don't recall that we actually have a cap of 40. I think 41, I thought. I don't ever, having been on Pine Hill, we sort of, it was brought to us annually if, you know, two students or a sibling apply. It's been past right. practice for 10 or so, but it, it varies. It's, it's, it's our practice. Right. We haven't actually had, like, at least in the elementary, two per grade. Oh, yes. Yeah. Back to back to say it's first grade and fifth grade, so you can have uh, two. I, mean, I don't know. It feels like it would be nice to have two, at least two per grade, I would say, as a philosophical. I mean, we're very involved. And other than Westwood, if you turn the page, and I was like, all right, at least we're not Westwood. But, but to your yeah, point, Carolyn, Monique uh, Marshall Guild of METCO coordinator yeah. does try to make sure that there's a cohort mm -hmm. assigned to each grade level. So the two per grade level does make sense. When we receive folders from that co inc of students who are interested, we look to fill in to assure that there is that cohort model. But if I may, and, and I, maybe I'm speaking out of turn because I haven't been around that long, but. Uh, I believe that the, the concept of a cap is not a formal concept. It is related to traditionally what the number has been. Uh, METCO, to my knowledge, does not have caps for their member districts. Um, and that the, the, uh, the size of a district's program uh, is is determined by the district. So, so the question, you know, what is the right size, is uh, is not bound from Metco's perspective, uh, and based on any kind of you know number or or, or cap that we can't conceive. I have a question. Do you happen to know whether the correct. whether all the districts start in K or do some? Because it would seem like from a classroom management perspective, we'd have more flexibility come middle school or high school, but I know our practice is to start students as early as the student one and, and carry through. Do you know if the other districts have more than another entry point midway through their 12 years? Natick does. Um, uh, they assimilate students in grade five. But what they found, and that's based on my prior experience, is that the um, knowledge base and the um, ability for students to adjust socially and emotionally is more difficult at that level. Although we have had students enter in the fourth grade because there was a student who came forward and it matched what we needed for our numbers or matched the placement. Um, but usually most of these are usually kindergarten or first grade. Yeah. Okay. But it is, uh, that's a really, it's an interesting question and you know, should the conversation go further, I think would be another uh, data point to collect, just just for comparison purposes. But after the data was collected, we did note, for example, that if you look at the region districts here, uh, if you look at Concord Carlisle, uh, their enrollment is is 59, and that's 9 through 12. Right. But what's interesting is if you look at the two towns, the oh, FEMA Concord, towns, right there, yeah. Concord and Carlisle, Right. Uh, you know, Concord K-8 has 90 students enrolled huh. and, and uh, Carlisle does not participate. Does not participate in K-8, but, uh, but there's 90, so there, there's a number of students so who don't move on to the regional high school from, 
from Congress. It, it might be just so, an interesting question to ask Monique right. next year of just what her what what her thoughts are on it. Would would it would is it something that we could consider? Well, or or is it in the best interest of the student and when the student? That's what I mean. Yeah. Like for, so, for Monique to apply on the student perspective. When yeah. they may enter. Correct. But it looks yeah. like Concord has roughly ten per grade. Right. And Concord Carlisle, which is only four years, has sixty. So they somehow Oh, well, no, it's just that well, when you think about it mathematically, we're, we're, we're different. Remember, when you yes. should know anything. <laughs> we're not like anybody else. No. I was with you though for a minute. That's so right. That was true. Can you rewind the two last, just the last two minutes? Let's talk about. Just like an MCAS. Well, now I'm muttering to Richard. I really can put you on the hot spot. I'm not answering. Winchester did not participate in the program. So Winchester is a very interesting story. They were uh, an initial participant when it was created, I think, in 1968, yes. and uh, participated for four years. In 1972, I don't know the reason why, uh, decided to withdraw. And But since 1972 has supported uh, uh, an ABC program Okay. A Better Chance yeah. program, which is a national program, yeah. and uh, but and there's a it's been a well, over 45 years now that mm -hmm. they've they've supported that program and those students those students come into the district uh, at grade nine mm -hmm. and attend Winchester High School. They live in the district in a in a residence. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a neat program. Like board. Yeah, well, so it's yeah, it's like a boarding right. school, okay. it, much but unfortunately it's much smaller. You know, the annual numbers were between eight and ten students. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have quite the impact that that, that the METCO program can have on, on um, you know, on diversity mm -hmm. and, and other issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This so, is great. Since it's here, uh -huh. I, I do find this interesting that this opportunity is only limited the students in Boston, and then to me it feels like this is kind of a a 50-year historical artifact of a, his, a bad time of Boston's history. And I question why a concept like this isn't available to like a town like Framingham, where in some parts of Framingham there's similar levels, if not higher, of poverty. And, and we would have a program that actually would, would bring adjacency to this kind of, again, diversity process, rather than having students take a 45, 50, 60 minute bus ride when there are probably some kids from Framingham that could take buses that would be just as, no longer than some of what our kids are already on buses. So I just, I just find it kind of curious around, if you thought outside the bo box, there may be a different way to do this, still meet the traditional needs and provide other opportunities in terms of getting our students familiar with the communities that are just around us. And I think particularly anyone who drives frequently between Sherborne and Framingham, I think is much more aware of the, the economic differences that are just side by side. I mean, it's an economic gradient that is unlike most other places except maybe Palo Alto and East Palo Alto and some spots like that. I think there are a couple of drivers. Uh, first, uh, there is a similar program uh, in the Springfield area. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, 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 the kind of quick answer, Michael, is there is another avenue uh, and that's school choice. Uh, and uh, you know the the what's what the what what the difference is, and, and obviously Metco uh, by decades preceded you know school yeah. choice. Uh, and although the funding, the state funding, is the same amount, so uh, for. We receive five thousand dollars for each Metco student. That's that's the base grant. A school choice, of course, that's what we receive 
uh, in state funding if we took school choice students in. The difference, though, is that that $5,000 would flows to school choice communities. Uh, it, it's state money, but it flows through yeah, the, 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 golf setting, right. the sending community. So it's it's not. But we wouldn't be able to construct a school choice we, program we, that we could not. that that was the that focal targeted. point is diversity yes. and the targeted saying right. we are looking for children in unrepresented yeah. right. minority groups right. that, that are not in the system. Yeah. Under the current yeah. state under the current structure. But I do feel like there are places that are very close to us that could benefit as much as not more so from this concept as as again a, a very well established, well functioning you know, Boston that Yeah, no, it's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next is the consent agenda, the approval of the minutes from the March 15th meeting. Anyone know any? I'll by a motion to approve the consent agenda. Um, no motion. Second? Second. Any changes? representation in the Dover Sherborne community in this production. We have a lead and a spouse, or spouses of, um, oh, now I'm, I've rehearsed the name over and over and over, um, choral director of the high school, uh, Jeff Harmon. He's in the production and his mm -hmm. wife is a lead. Oh, yes. Um, Mr. Dupre yeah. is a lead trumpet player uh, based on my one practice with him is extremely impressive. <laughs> player. Um, we have spouses involved in the prominent roles, and uh, the person with those off notes is me. And, and where are the tickets available for those? So best to Google Dover Foundation and Guys and Dolls. Okay. Because they're online their, their web address is thedoverfoundation.com. Is kind of messed up for a couple of reasons. <laughs> And um, profits go to supporting scholarships. But Great there's fun. some very impressive talent above and beyond Mr. White in this production. There's mm -hmm. plenty of other talent. Established himself over the years. And um, for those of you who don't know, this is Mary's Wolf's last meeting with us. Oh, Mary. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. How many years for the region? I know it's six oh, years for the advisory. Uh, father. Five. Five wonderful years. <laughs> and it. if the election process proceeds as expected, 
Mary's going to take on a new role yes. as a neutral moderator. As our town moderator. Yes. I'm already practicing. So she will not <laughs> be on the sides on issues. So, I'll be the woman with no opinion. So it's good that we all <laughs> seek new, new opportunities. And yeah. Well, thank you, Mary. I would say I would say you helped make us better. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It really has. We will always think of trend line budgeting. <laughs> Watch me not opine. <laughs> and enjoy the day. <laughs> so we'll call, adjourn the meeting. Right. 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 Enjoy the sunshine. Yeah. Yeah.